Hello there, welcome to Talking Europe on France 24. Now here's a question for you. How do you feel about a Europe where it's impossible to buy a petrol or a diesel car? That's one of the plans put forward by the European Commission as it this week set out a huge package of laws all aimed at reaching ambitious climate targets. The package is called Fit for 55, referring to the reduction of carbon emissions in Europe by 55% compared to their levels in 1990 and all this by the year 2030. Now, these plans cover transport, housing, industry and more, including that aim to stop the sale of petrol and diesel cars by the year 2035. The European Commission president, Ursula von der Leyen, told reporters as she unveiled the package that this makes Europe the very first continent to present a comprehensive architecture for meeting its climate goals. Well, the whole thing will be scrutinised and amended by the EU's heads of state and by the European Parliament. Today, we'll be looking into this major announcement and some other pressing European issues with our guest, Philippe Lombard, someone who spends a good part of his time talking about the climate as co-chair of the Greens Group at the European Parliament. Mr Lombard, thank you for being with us on Talking Europe. A pleasure. Well, let's um, start by talking about climate issues. In fact, uh, just this week, uh, we've seen dozens of people have died in, in Germany and in Belgium as well uh, in flooding. Uh, is this a consequence of a changing climate? Well, that's what scientists are telling us, that uh, global warming translates into more severe episodes of droughts, but also more episodes of torrential rains. And that's what we are witnessing. And and again, people uh, say that we never saw that since uh, decades, if not centuries. Uh, well, we need to get accustomed to, uh, to these events because uh, climate change is already underway. You know, some people say this is an issue for future generations. No, it is. it has started. It is uh, for this generation too. And I hope that this will be enough to uh, to uh, to vanquish the, the the huge resistance we are facing for serious climate action. Mm. Uh, because believe me, uh, for some in some business quarters, uh, immediate profits are more important than uh, people dying from uh, climate change. Well, let's give um, our viewers a couple of more details on that big green news of the week. Uh, Twelve legislative proposals have been put forward. The three main ones are expanding emissions trading to cars, buildings and ships, uh, a kind of tax uh, on imports from countries without strong climate legislation and changing energy taxation from focusing on volume to content. Uh, Philippe Lombert, uh, can the European Commission reach its uh, climate targets with this package? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, is, is this target enough uh, to remain, uh, to keep our promises in Paris? The answer is no. We should uh, have uh, a target of a reduction of a minus 60 to minus 65. But on the other hand, the minus 55 target is a clear improvement from the, the current target that, uh, that is minus 40. Now, the 12 proposals are meant to lead us there. But there are many uh, uh, question marks remaining because on some aspects it is not ambitious enough. And I have my doubts that indeed the expansion of uh, the EU carbon market to uh, buildings and to cars is the best way to achieve the target. Uh, we have serious doubts about that and the Greens are not alone on that. We also know that this is also a way to put the climate pressure initially uh, and, and, uh, and uh, heavily on the consumer, whereas we believe that actually we have to work uh, uh, and to put pressure on the producers mm -hmm. so that uh, they stop proposing uh, mm -hmm. uh, climate uh, uh, negative uh, products and services. This is what they should feel. They should feel the pressure instead of the consumer. Well, just to pick up on that point you said about expanding the emissions uh, trading to cars, building ships, uh, transport is actually the area that's seen the biggest rise in emissions since 1990. Uh, meanwhile, power supply, for example, has made huge progress slashing emissions massively. Isn't it right that we make change in the areas where things are, in fact, getting worse? Absolutely, but there's many ways to do that. You can put the car manufacturers under pressure, and well, to some extent, uh, the set of legislations does that, but in our view, not enough. Uh, but you know, the most uh, uh, emitting sector in terms of transport is aviation, and aviation 
frankly speaking, has yet to feel the full pressure. And actually, the reality is that we cannot continue moving people and tons uh, uh, through the air as we do today. This is simply incompatible with respecting the, 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 the boundaries of this planet. And uh, that is a point that is not really addressed uh, by, the, uh, by the Commission proposals. Well, in terms of what you're saying about whether individuals or businesses are taking the, the heavier uh, load on paying for all of this, uh, Brussels says they intend to set up a so-called social fund to shield poor and vulnerable people from rising fuel prices. And the commissioner in charge of all of this, Franz Timmermans, says he wants to prove that this all leads to solidarity. Yeah, well, I agree with Franz Timmermans that this is a big concern and no one wants uh, the yellow vest to, uh, to mobilize across Europe again, like they did in France for a good reason uh, a few years back. But then again, the social fund that is foreseen is nowhere big enough uh, to address uh, the impact on, uh, on the poor households uh, in, uh, in Europe. And because most of the levers uh, are, are taxation, so fiscal levers, that reside in the member states' hands. And again, I mean, if you want to do this right, you have to put the industries under pressure uh, because the actual thing is that it's first and foremost their profit margins that need to be impacted. You know, the kind of profits that we are witnessing in the economy nowadays are only possible if you exploit the planet and uh, living people uh, on, on, on this planet to the max. And actually, they are incompatible with an economy that respects the planetary boundaries. So the first people who should feel the impact of climate action are the people who are basically the rent seekers of the current system, rather than the, the, the precarious uh, consumers and workers that we are saying. I'm not saying that it's not going to have impact on, on the people on the street, but this impact needs to be mitigated by a complete transformation of our taxation systems, and that is not in the European Commission's hands, but in the member states. We're talking about uh, issues relating to taxes. Uh, I mentioned one of the major planks of these proposals uh, is to do with uh, imposing a levy on goods imported into the EU from countries that don't meet the same high standards that are imposed within the European Union. Uh, the idea would be that the EU uh, brings about change outside of the bloc as well as inside. Do you think this will work to pull non-EU countries along in the, in the same direction? Well, I, I've always thought that, uh, you know, putting rules on yourself uh, while keeping your market completely open uh, for people who do not uh, respect these rules is, uh, at the one, on one hand, an economic suicide and uh, just displacing the problems. Because actually, when you factor in uh, imported emissions, what you see is that the European Union has not significantly reduced if at all its emissions uh, since uh, 1990. And therefore, this is, of course, a wise thing to do. Yet, uh, you know, the, the European Union has one big lever uh, on the rest of the world, and that is access to its market. And we have been too long, too naive about uh, free trade. You know, re uh, China imposes restrictions to access to its, its market. So do the United States. Why should Europe be the only naive link in that band and, and keeping its market open at no conditions? A, there is a concern, though, isn't there, that this could lead to retaliatory measures that actually take Europe into a trade war, which is damaging in other ways. But hang on one second, aren't we in a trade war uh, already? I mean, are, are the US and China not protectionist states? Come on. I mean, look at what, what happened under Trump and even before Trump. Do you believe really that we Europeans have free access to the United States? Let me just take one example. Back in time, Airbus won the contract to replace the United States Air Force tankers. And this contract was, was uh, rescinded by the United States government because Boeing didn't get it. And finally, Boeing got it with an inferior product. And, and that, that, by the way, still does not deliver. Uh, so, so, I mean, the United States and China are markets uh, whose access is very, very restricted. So we should not fool ourselves. Uh, it's not, are we going to see retaliatory measures? I'm saying it's about time that the, the Europeans leave their naivety and uh, play big. I mean, yes, we have an attractive market. And yes, we appreciate foreign producers to access it. but at all conditions, at no one else's.
Just a word moving away from green issues um, about uh, values and rule of law within the European Union. Um, a, a recent issue uh, that I know you've spoken about, a law passed in Hungary that conflates homosexuality with paedophilia. Uh, the European Commission this week launched uh, infringement proceedings against the Hungarian government over this. Um, now, you have said uh, recently that you want to see the EU do more. Um, what more action would you like to see? Well, actually, uh, it's about time that the uh, European Commission takes action on, on this. But actually, I believe that these anti-LGBT measures are a smokescreen that these governments use to portray what they're doing as a fight for Christian civilization, as if Christian civilization never had any uh, uh, LGBT people. This is bullshit, of course. Uh, but the thing is that actually these two regimes are uh, uh, regimes that are... Uh, well, made up of, uh, well, based on political clientelism. That is, EU money is being channeled towards strengths of the government in place in order to support uh, the persistence of the of those governments in, uh, in, in, in power. And this is where action is needed. I do believe that the only thing that will really make the current Hungarian and current Polish government pay attention is when they will see that there will be real strings attached to money coming from the European Union. And if we are not prepared to pull those strings, then don't expect these governments to change tack. I do believe that they will still uh, uh, basically uh, play with European values as long as they are sure that this will have no financial consequences on the money flows to their countries from the European Union. And this is what needs to change. All right, Philippe Lambert, thank you very much for speaking to us here on Talking Europe. My pleasure. Thanks to you for watching as well. And do stay with us uh, coming up part two of Talking Europe, where we're going to be debating the impact of COVID on the European cinema industry. Do stay with us.